paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. From the ancient world to the modern, history tells the story of our ever-growing need to be ever-growing. The story of how some people will go to extraordinary lengths to expand, create, to advance, to push the realm of possibility, to prove that size matters. This series will explore larger-than-life creations that have influenced every facet of our society. The way we live, work and travel. The way we build empires and the way we dream. We look back at the ways we've strived to make the biggest, heaviest, tallest, the best. We hear from experts about the technology that made these feats possible, the challenges that were faced, and the problems that were solved. Some of these inventions have changed the world and our way of life. Others, not so much. Whether a success or a failure, these giants have demonstrated mankind's need to build big. The human race is constantly looking for a better way to get from point A to point B. From tall ships to the invention of the automobile, travel has always been a necessity and we have always relied on increasingly mammoth methods of transportation. Planes, trains, and ships, and everything in between. Human beings, by nature, want to do things bigger, faster, beat the next person. It's part of our DNA. This is the story of how we learned to travel big. The fastest and most efficient method of travel available to us today is, of course, air travel. There is an enormous demand. At Chicago O'Hare International Airport, for example, an aircraft takes off or lands every 37 seconds. So, it comes as no surprise that, with such huge demand for air travel, aircraft manufacturers had to upscale. On May 1, 1996, Airbus Industry created its large aircraft division. Charged with developing plans for an Airbus that would dominate the large commercial jet market, On December 19, 2000, the jumbo jet that Airbus dubbed the flagship of the 21st century was launched commercially. This is the Airbus A380. It is currently the biggest passenger aircraft in the world and has the stats to prove it. With an overall length of 72.7 meters, the double-decker aircraft is so vast, 3,600 liters of paint are needed to paint its exterior. At 24.1 meters high, the tail of the plane is as tall as a 10-story building. 
and its hefty weight of 580 tons is equivalent to 165 elephants. But of course, creating an aircraft of this size was no easy feat. Airbus encountered significant delivery delays thanks to the bottlenecks in the definition, manufacturing, and installation of the A380's electrical systems, and the more than 500 kilometers of internal wiring in the plant. This, combined with the customization of aircraft to customer specifications, led Airbus to devise new processes for the outfitting of the A380 fuselage sections and a revised pacing for their final assembly line. This marvel of engineering is enormous and it has taken its place in the ongoing revolution in the way we travel. A revolution that started with humble beginnings and along the way produced some predecessors of the A380 that were not entirely successful. The Graf Zeppelin proved that long-range travel by airship was possible. Completed with the help of the Nazi government, the Hindenburg's first flight took place on March the 4th, 1936. It was a 245-metre-long beast. But it had a fatal flaw in that it was filled with hydrogen rather than an inert gas like helium, which is what you would use today. The Zeppelin company designed the Hindenburg to be a helium airship. But at the time, helium was only available as a byproduct of American industry and the USA banned its export. And hydrogen, of course, is highly flammable. The Hindenburg was the first airliner to provide a regularly scheduled service between Europe and North America. The airship was the fastest and most luxurious way to cross the Atlantic. They ate in an elegant dining room, listened to the piano on the lounge, and enjoyed cigars in the ship's smoking room. Lingering long enough to drop election pamphlets on the big-eyed crowds beneath, the airship sails on to Cologne, where they circle the famous cathedral. Then, famously, on May 6, 1937, the Hindenburg burst into flames while tethering at the end of an Atlantic crossing. 62 of the 97 passengers survived, but this, after 35 years of accidents and disasters, signified the end of the airship era. But it made people think, well, if an airship can do it, perhaps we can start looking at conventional aircraft that can do it. Some aircraft have even shorter careers than the airship though, admittedly, they were less hazardous. In 1944, Britain's Bristol Aeroplane Company unveiled the Bristol Brabazon. It was a very simple ceremony for such a spectacular machine as the Brabazon, which is bigger than any aircraft in the world that has yet flown. It weighed about the same as the Space Shuttle, at over 68 tonnes, and it was a sight to behold. When they built the Brabazon, the factory at Filton in England, where it was built, they had to extend the runway to accommodate it. When the plane first took to the air, pilot Bill Pegg is claimed to have said, good God, it works. The crowd below cheered, and the story was transmitted around the world on what was one of the first uses of live outside broadcasting after the war. 
It was intended to fly between New York and London, basically, carrying 100 passengers. The Brabazon paved the way for all those that came after it. It is still the biggest aircraft to have been built in Britain and had a longer wingspan than any modern airliner except the A380. Its power came from eight paired engines that could propel it to 480 kilometers an hour and would have sent it across the Atlantic in 12 hours. It flew magnificently. It did everything expected of it, and no one bought it. With its small capacity, thanks to its focus on luxury, it ultimately proved too expensive. It's interesting looking at it now, typically 100 passengers for an aeroplane that big, whereas today we'd have 400. It would be 20 years before another jumbo aircraft took to the skies, but its designers would not make the same mistake. The Boeing 747 became the workhorse of the world's long-haul high-capacity fleet. It revolutionized airline travel, there is no doubt about that, simply because of its size. First rolled out in September 1968 at Boeing's Everett plant in Seattle. Fittingly, itself the largest building in the world. To date, Boeing has delivered 1,365 747s. By January 1989, Boeing was rolling out a new 747 every six days. Millions of people who could not previously afford to fly internationally suddenly could. So its contribution was enormous. The Boeing 747 has succeeded as a freighter, a military airborne emergency command and control post, the presidential Air Force One transport, and one 747 was even used to transport the space shuttle. Powered by four turbofans, the Boeing 747 is the world's fastest subsonic passenger jet and can travel the length of three football pitches in one second. It has carried more than 3.5 billion passengers on 56 billion kilometers of service with 80 airlines. There's still people in Boeing who don't like it being called the jumbo jet, but I don't think that's ever going to go away, that name. <laughs> For all the success the 747 and the A380 have enjoyed, there's now a new breed of aircraft being developed, or rather, an old one being reinvented. And it's very big. Part plane and part airship, the Airlander 10 took off on its maiden flight from Cardington Airfield in Bedfordshire in England on August 17, 2016. Officially named Martha Gwynn and unofficially named the Flying Bum, it is about 15 metres longer than even the biggest passenger jets. The Airlander 10 is very, very large. It's as long as the football field. It's over 90 metres long. The Airlander was first developed for the US government as a surveillance aircraft. But the project was shelved due to defence cutbacks. British firm Hybrid Air Vehicles launched a campaign to return the Airlander 10 to the skies in May 2015. The massive aircraft could be used for surveillance, communications, delivering aid, and even passenger travel. But the important thing and the interesting thing is it can stay airborne for many, many days. 
Hybrid Air Vehicles hopes to deliver 10 airlanders a year by 2021. The airlander was launched from Cardigan Sheds, a Grade II listed relic of World War I, which housed airships in the late 1920s. A week later, the airlander embarked on its second flight, only to crash after clipping a telegraph pole. While the crew suffered no injuries, it just goes to show the road to success is always under construction. At the end of the day, if we don't support things that are a little bit advanced, a little bit unusual, we don't make any progress, do we? For all the comforts that can be sampled in the air, air travel can't really compete with the grandeur, luxury, and elegance of ocean travel. They're grand ships and the feeling in the night with the sky of stars, it's a feeling of stately power, marvellous ships. And one infamous ship more than any other has come to represent the golden age of the ocean liner. A century has passed since the luxury steamship RMS Titanic met its catastrophic end in the North Atlantic. More than 1,500 people lost their lives in the disaster. It was on May 31, 1911, that the Titanic's immense hull, at the time the largest movable man-made object in the world, was launched. Now, Titanic had been built to the highest standards of the day. In fact, she exceeded the highest standards of the day in some ways. The Titanic featured a double bottom and 15 watertight bulkheads equipped with electric watertight doors, which could be operated individually or simultaneously. These bulkheads inspired Shipbuilder magazine to pronounce it practically unsinkable. However, while the Titanic's individual bulkheads were watertight, water could still spill from one compartment into another. Another flaw in the Titanic's design was the number of lifeboats carried. The boats could accommodate 1,178 people. But the Titanic could carry more than 3,300 people. At about 11.30 p.m. on April 14, 1912, an iceberg's underwater spur slashed a 90-meter gash in the Titanic's waterline. Only 705 people survived. In many ways, it was a turning point, a shock for the traveling public and for everybody that uh, such a large ship could sink, but any ship can sink. Ship safety regulations have improved since 1912, in part through lessons learned from the Titanic's tragic loss. So when, between the wars and facing the threat from air travel, the race was on to build bigger and better ships, safety was not forgotten. One of the shipbuilding triumphs of the period was the first of the great Cunadas to carry a queen's name. She was 1,019 feet long and about 81,000 tons gross, uh, three funnels, of large, elegant ship and the biggest liner in the world at the time. The Queen Mary moves. The rudder at her stern strikes the water and gracefully her long hull glides down the slipway. Intended to rival the French Normandy, the Queen Mary at 81,000 tons three times the weight of the Statue of Liberty, won the day. 
Queen Mary was so big that when she was built, it was thought that she would scarcely notice the sea. It is said that they had decided not to put handrails down the main passageways through the accommodation because they wouldn't be needed. Well, handrails were subsequently fitted because she too could roll. On July 1, 1936, the Queen Mary embarked on her maiden voyage and attempted to win the Blue Riband, the accolade given to the fastest ship to cross the Atlantic. After failing on its first attempt due to poor weather, it attempted the voyage again on August 31, reaching New York in three days, 23 hours and 57 minutes. The Blue Riband was hers. The Queen Mary does it again on the voyage home. Having averaged 31.69 knots, nearly half a knot more than the Normandy's best, she docks at Southampton, undisputed Queen of the Atlantic. She had 24 boilers supplying the steam for her steam turbines. This occupied an enormous proportion of her hull. Most of the volume of the ship really was taken up by the machinery to drive her across the North Atlantic. The Queen Mary was the transport of choice for many of the great and famous of the age. By the late 1960s, the market for mass transatlantic travel had been lost to the airlines. The last of the great Atlantic liners began disappearing one by one. Queen Elizabeth II was launched by the Queen uh, on the afternoon of the 27th of September 1967 before an enormous crowd. It was a very impressive day. I was happened to be lucky enough to be there myself. Described by Princess Margaret as the flagship for the nation, she was the embodiment of British luxury. At 294 metres long, she was the length of 40 London buses end to end. With a modest weight of 70,327 tonnes. Upon her arrival, she received what was possibly the last gala welcome of a ship in New York Harbor. In 1975, Cunard sent their flagship on her first world cruise. This was a promise of things to come. The Queen Elizabeth II would survive, even amidst the domination of air travel, and is arguably the last of the true liners. The cruise industry has exploded since those days. One would not have imagined in the 1960s, in 50 years' time, uh, we would be building so many enormous large passenger ships simply to take people on a holiday. But we do. There are some ships so advanced and luxurious that what they offer is quite different from and cannot be compared to air travel. Consider the Grand Princess. She measures 289 meters in length, four times the wingspan of a 747, and 57 meters high. A 1998 campaign read, we believe this truth to be self-evident. There's never been a bigger, more expensive cruise ship. They weren't joking. At the time, the Grand Princess was the largest and most expensive cruise ship ever built. She cost about half a billion dollars to build and weighed over 107,000 tons. Grand Princess features 1,300 staterooms and suites, accommodating 2,592 passengers and 1,100 crew. To manage the number of passengers, Grand Princess was the first liner to assign passengers to numerous dining rooms. 
Grand Princess owes much of her success to the innovative design and layout which has inspired her successors. In a time dominated by air travel, Grand Princess showed everyone how to travel in style. But despite its enormity, it has predictably been overtaken in the size department. More than five times the size of the Titanic, the Oasis of the Seas features 2,606 rooms that can accommodate a record-breaking 6,296 passengers. Amongst the largest cruise ships in the world are the Oasis-class cruise ships which have recently been built and they're 225,000 gross tons, which is a very large ship indeed. Accommodation includes loft suites, massive two-storey, 139 square metre apartments with a master bedroom, a private balcony and whirlpool. Some people view them as a, an apartment block lying on its side. The entire ship is so huge, it is divided into seven neighborhoods. The Central Park neighborhood includes shops, restaurants, and flower gardens. The outdoor aqua theater seats 600 and features nightly shows with water acrobats and aerial performers. The pool deck stretches over the entire length of the ship. As the embodiment of extravagance containing anything you could ever and never need at sea, the Oasis of the Seas is the crown jewel of cruise ships and was the world's largest passenger vehicle until the recent allure of the seas, which has surpassed the Oasis in size by a whopping five centimeters. So, ships and planes have carved out distinct and complementary markets. Another people mover seemed to be doomed by the rise in road transport. But by building bigger, better, and most of all, faster, it has enjoyed an astonishing renaissance. All over the world, people are returning to the railways. There's about a million kilometers of railway line in the world. The world's first commercial high-speed magnetically levitated train was built in Shanghai, China in 2004. While the third maglev line to be built, Shanghai has the only commercially operated high-speed maglev in the world. Maglev stands for magnetic levitation. This was constructed a little bit of a showpiece. It's almost a, a demonstrator. They use uh, electromagnets and like polarity, they get the train to be repelled to cause the train to be held in the air by the magnets on the structure. speed of 431 kilometers an hour means that the 30 kilometer trip takes less than eight minutes. The train has operated every day and has accumulated over 16.7 million kilometers with an average on-time reliability of 99.98%. And they also use uh, a form of electromagnetic propulsion too. Again, it's attraction between magnets in the structure, magnets on the train. So they get very fast speeds out of it.
a much longer journey, journeys through the middle of the world's driest inhabited continent. In its way, it is the past rather than the future of train travel. But people love it for that. And the train is always full. It's called the GAN. When hauling its full complement of carriages, the GAN is the world's longest passenger train at 774 meters. Two and a half times longer than the Queen Elizabeth II. It was named the GAN in honor of the Afghan camel drivers who had been the, the means, the only means of transport for the, a lot of the inland areas of Australia. The tracks were constantly being damaged by termites and fires, and floods often washed away the track completely. In 1980, the old GAN rail track was abandoned in favor of a new standard gauge rail line. Built with termite-proof concrete sleepers laid further to the west, to avoid flooding. The GAN was always intended to one day travel all the way across the continent. And on February 1, 2004, the GAN embarked on its first transcontinental journey. The track from Adelaide to Darwin, it's almost 3,000 kilometres. Uh, 2,970 kilometres. Takes an astonishing 54 hours with a four hour break in the middle. Since the GAN entered service, railway technology has made astonishing advances. Speed and comfort particularly linking city centres with a convenience that air travel cannot match, has become the byword. It is the new age of rail travel, the age of the bullet train and the TGV. From when it first entered service in September 1981, the French train a grande vitesse TGV has been at the forefront of European high-speed rail travel. They're fast. The track has to be long radius curves and not rough, but smooth track with no significant bumps or disruptions in the track profile. It holds the world speed record for conventional wheeled manned passenger trains after reaching 574.8 kilometers an hour. But there are issues that must be taken into account when it comes to traveling at these speeds. For starters, these trains need a massive amount of energy. A train traveling at 480 kilometers per hour uses roughly 27 times more power than one traveling at 160 kilometers per hour. A problem even more pressing is the fact that human bodies simply aren't built for rapid acceleration. And traveling at these speeds makes us more prone to motion sickness. To combat this, the TGV decreases its degree of tilt when cornering, so passengers can feel when the train is turning. The TGVs also have a feature where the wheel sets are shared between two adjacent cars because it reduces the ability of adjacent carriages to jump relative to each other. It smooths out the whole operation of the train. On one of its most popular routes, the TGV travels at more than 490 kilometers an hour. In only two hours and 20 minutes, the engineering innovation is the design of the whole system to be reliable, to be fast and to be safe at the same time. A Euro
European very fast train that undertakes a quite special, quite different style of journey is the Eurostar. It travels under the sea. Eurostar trains speed through the tunnel channel with the longest undersea section of any tunnel in the world at 38 kilometers. The only place that this locomotive operates is in the Channel Tunnel between the United Kingdom and France. Recognized as one of the seven wonders of the modern world by the American Society of Civil Engineers. Alongside the likes of the Empire State Building and the Panama Canal. It's only a 35 minute trip, so it's kind of special. It's the only place these uh, locomotives are used. Up to 400 trains pass through the tunnel every day, carrying an average of 50,000 passengers. That's more people between England and France than all airlines combined. Passengers can even bring their vehicles with them by simply driving on and off the shuttles. Almost every type of vehicle can be transported and cars can be loaded with as much stuff as passengers like because there are no excess luggage fees. As for the trains themselves, they stretch to 775 metres long, the same length as eight football pitches. They're quite a powerful locomotive, six axles, specially designed and built for this particular purpose. All of it, of course, controlled by the train driver. But driverless for all modes of transport is very much the way of the future. There are driverless trains, typically at major airports, ferrying people short distances between terminals. But in one place, they operate as an entire urban transit system. The Dubai Metro has entered the Guinness World Records as the longest driverless metro network in the world. It started operating in 2009. It's about 75 kilometres of track. Um, and they're increasing that. Dubai's population is expected to reach 5.25 million by 2020. And improving transport with the ever-expanding city is vital to Dubai's future. The metro has presented itself as a solution to road congestion, travel times and increasing pollution. The term metro has different uses in different places. Trains which don't run to timetable have a turn up and catch the train sort of thing, so they have to have a high frequency between the trains. An average of 500,000 people use it every day. And to date, over 500 million passengers have travelled on its trains, which can reach speeds of 110 kilometres an hour along the longest tracks for unmanned trains in the world. You can run more trains per hour, you can unload and load them more frequently because they're single deck and you're not waiting for people to file into a narrow space to find a seat. The driverless metro is a safe and reliable way to travel without the risk of human error. The system that operates the metro, called cell track, can run without human interference. Indeed, the entire metro system is overlooked by only 10 people. For a method of transport that began dying out after the 1920s, it would be an understatement to say that rail travel has made a comeback. To measure the number of passengers that are moving around per day, they are measured in passengers per kilometre. And there's something in the order of 9 billion passenger kilometres per day across the world. But the serious competition that threatened trains throughout the 20th century isn't going to go away. 
In 2012, 76.3% of US commuters traveled by car. In 2014, over 252.7 million cars were in use in Europe. It seems no matter how big the plane, luxurious the ship, or fast the train, cars dominate the way we travel today. Which is why it is not trains, ships, or planes that fuel our aspirational dreams, it's cars like the Rolls-Royce. The Rolls-Royce Phantom was built with the aim of being the best car in the world. Introduced in 2003, the first of a new generation of Rolls-Royce cars after BMW's takeover of the mark the Phantom is hand-built, with its exterior trim and upholstery taking weeks to stitch. There are hundreds and hundreds of paint colours, leathers, different wood grains in the dash, even stones and carbon fibre. And taking it to the absolute extreme, if you've got a colour that isn't on their palette, they will make it for you and even name it after you. Its 12-cylinder engine, sourced from BMW, propels it to 100 kilometers an hour in less than six seconds. They are the tallest production cars currently being built, with models measuring over 1.6 meters high. It is huge. <laughs> I'd have to say I've driven one a few times in the English country roads around where it's built, and it is intimidating to drive on a small road, I tell you. Each Phantom takes at least two months to build. Each is bespoke. Each is the epitome of luxury. It is supremely comfortable, whisper quiet, and just beautiful in every aspect. The personalization is absolutely second to none. You can have a car that literally nobody else on the planet can own. Various versions take the top three spots on lists of most expensive luxury cars. But despite the high price tag, it seems drivers get their money's worth. Approximately 65% of all Rolls-Royce cars ever built are still on the road. Paradoxically, this means that though the roller is exclusive, it is not exceptionally rare. Unlike the Mercedes-Benz 770K, of which only 88 were ever built. Originally, they were commissioned by General Nikolaus von Falkenhurst, who commanded the Nazi invasion of Norway and Denmark. While the 770K was Falkenhurst's vehicle of choice, its most famous owner was Adolf Hitler, who did not even know how to drive. It was an elegant and extravagant car, and the largest car that Mercedes-Benz had produced to date. It is the heaviest car ever made. It's become infamous for a number of reasons. Its nickname is the Grosse, which means big and heavy in German. It weighed about three and a half tonnes, which is huge for its time. It had a big straight eight supercharged engine, which only produced about 150 kilowatts, which is not much in modern terms, but back then it was pretty significant. This was probably the first factory produced luxury car. At this time, the 770K was the most expensive German passenger car that money could buy. In 2009, an unnamed Russian billionaire bought Hitler's dark blue open-top 770K for several million euros. Today, because of their rarity, style and some of that historical significance, restored examples fetch up to millions, tens of millions of dollars. 
classic car dealer Michael Froelich remarked that the pride of the collection, Hitler's car, is going to Moscow. He then added, which is more than the Nazi dictator ever managed. Perhaps if he had been driving a Hummer. AM General started making high-mobility multi-purpose wheeled vehicles, or Humvees, for the US Army in 1983. With over 40 centimeters of ground clearance, the Humvee could climb over a 56 centimeter high obstacle, handling a 60% grade, and wade through up to 76 centimeters of water. It had some technology in there that was meant to take it into terrains that no man was ever meant to see. It's got a lot of ground clearance so it can get over boulders and a really solid four-wheel drive system that allows it to plough through the bush, mud, anywhere it wants to go. It wasn't until 1992 that AM General started building civilian models. Introduced as the Hummer H1, the massive four-wheel drive earned a reputation when it became the ride of choice among Hollywood celebrities and professional athletes. As an SUV, it is huge. It fits right in in America. Everything has to be big. It's got to be bigger than Texas. It's got to be bigger than its competition. And to live up to the military nature, it was just big. The Hummer has the widest wheel track of any SUV in the world at 330.2 centimeters wide. And it weighs in at more than three tons. A Hummer is nearly one meter wider than a compact car and weighs more than two average family cars, making it somewhat less than practical. Maneuvering in traffic and parking in narrow city streets can be extremely tricky. The H1 was discontinued in 2006, but for all its failings as a private vehicle, the Humvee served the US military well. Better suited to combat than comfort, and not built for speed. But speed is what appeals, and has always appealed to the passionate motorist. And the passionate motorist has always been prepared to pay for the thrill of going to the edge. Meet the Viper. The Dodge Viper has the largest motor in any currently made production car. It's powered by an immense 8.4-litre V10 engine. It is an all-American action supercar. Its big engine is literally out of a truck, but they've transformed it into a performance car engine that just is brutal. Based on the Chrysler LA V8 truck engine, the V10 was designed by the supercar maker Lamborghini who were a division of Chrysler at the time. Dodge boasted a 300 horsepower engine when it showed the Viper as a concept. But as of 2016, the Viper ACR far exceeds this. It produces about 480 kilowatts in its top spec, which is probably about five times the average small hatchback. It can also reach 100 kilometers per hour in just 3.4 seconds. The Viper's rear wheel tires measure a staggering 350 millimeters across, which makes them the widest tires currently fitted to a production car. Considered one of America's only genuine supercars, the Viper definitely lives up to its impressive namesake. What makes it unique is it's got huge amounts of torque and it can spin its tyres up pretty easily. But 
but we keep building bigger and bigger. So, it's no surprise that there's a faster car in town. With a top speed of 407 kilometers per hour, the Bugatti Veyron is the fastest production car ever built. It delivers 1,001 horsepower and can accelerate from zero to 100 in less than three seconds. In all, the Bugatti Veyron has as much engine output as two Corvette Z06 V8s. The Bugatti Veyron is an engineering feat. It has an 8-litre, 12-cylinder engine with four turbochargers. For an engine like this, 11 radiators and 64 valves are needed. It literally holds the record as the fastest production car at 430-odd kilometres an hour. Specially made Michelin Pax Pilot tyres are needed for the car and they cost a modest $6,500 each. The tyres also needed to be specially made to handle 430 kilometres an hour, otherwise they would blow out. While driving at top speed, these tyres will only last 15 minutes and the 100 litre fuel tank will be empty in 12 minutes. The first Veyron was made in 2005 and 10 years later, in 2015, the last was sold. In total, Bugatti built only 450 Veyrons. They've been handmade by master craftsmen and just that power. Having the world's fastest car is a pretty big status symbol. Going faster than the Veyron may be difficult unless roads and traffic management are improved. But there is no such curb on rail or air travel. And very little to stop us from building bigger and bigger on the oceans. Why is man fascinated with building big things? Some might say because he can. But a lot of it ultimately will come down to economics or prestige. It comes from pushing the boundaries, making it faster, making it bigger, making it more efficient. The successes the failures, the breakthroughs, and the catastrophes. From the efficient, to the beautiful, to the downright superfluous. Ever since we've had places to go, we've found bigger and better ways to get there. And no doubt, our appetite for travel will continue to drive the development of machines that take us places.